All right, I'm here with Dr. Katz today. Um, he has an article coming up in the April publication of the Journal of Rheumatology. Um, Dr. Katz is gonna outline his publication uh, and give you a little bit of an overview. And then we're gonna dive in a little bit deeper and just ask a few questions on the impact it'll have on the community. So Dr. Katz, could you outline your abstract that you had um, that's being published in the upcoming journal? So the, the article is entitled Intramuscular pressure is almost three times higher in fibromyalgia patients, a possible mechanism for understanding the muscle pain and tenderness. So um, we rheumatologists see a lot of fibromyalgia. We've seen it for years. None of us feel like we understand it. And a lot of the research has focused on the brain, which is obviously playing an important role in terms of pain sensitivity, in terms of uh, central sensitization and, and whatever. Um, no critique of central mechanisms, but everybody has known for a long time that the pain in fibromyalgia is so widespread, it appears to be muscular. For years, muscle tenderness in different sites, uh, muscle tenderness was a criterion for the diagnosis of fibromyalgia. You have to have so many tender muscles. So what the heck are the muscles tender for? Why do patients often identify themselves as having a muscle pain, widespread muscle pain. Sometimes they say joint pain, but joint and muscle pain. So the muscle. So when you look back at the history of muscle pain in fibromyalgia, you see that years ago, 20, 25 years ago, muscle biopsies were done to understand the muscle tenderness, the muscle pain. What did they show? Hypoxia. No inflammation. They showed lack of oxygenation. So why is there hypoxia in the muscles? No inflammation in these fibromyalgia patients. Why is there? So uh, a couple of years ago, we started to developing a technique to measure the muscle pressure. So we took the trapezius muscle just for convenience and we stuck a needle with attached to a pressure gauge. The pressure gauge was used to assess anterior compartment syndrome. You know, the lower leg anteriorly is extremely painful after a sports injury. And it's so difficult and it might be putting pressure on the blood vessels and nerves that we need to assess the interior compartment pressure. So we took that pressure gauge and we said, well, what if we assess the pressure in the muscles in fibromyalgia? We used a different needle, smaller needle. We used, you know, uh, squirt, squirted in 0.3 cc of, cc's of sailing into the intramuscular area into about a quarter to a half inch into the trapezius muscle. Nobody complained about it, it like giving a soft tissue injection. And we measured the pressure in the muscle. Well, we were astonished the pressure is three times higher. I'll give you one example. A person who wants to work with me on this came in with his daughter. And uh, the daughter was is about 24, 20 or so and has widespread pain, subjectively intense. What, how's your pain? What's zero to 10? It's like eight out of 10. And the father's perplexed, bringing his daughter in, he's sitting in the chair. And I say, okay, we're gonna check your muscle pressure because she has such widespread pain. It was like 32 millimeters of mercury. So I used the person in the room as the control. And the father was like 12 millimeters of mercury and their eyes lit up. Nobody has ever found anything in my daughter. This guy would wanted to help me develop the device. He was so excited. So you see that a lot. The mother, the spouse, the uh, sibling, the friend, we use that person as a control and they never mind it really, just a needle stick. And it's muscle pressure is so much higher in fibromyalgia. So is there an intramuscular etiology, at least a peripheral uh, mechanism for all this pain in fibromyalgia? I think there is. Not to say there's not a central uh, issue too, but there is a, uh, a peripheral muscle injury. And so that's what we found. So it seems like I, I have three categories of questions that I really want to ask kind of based on the research. So looking at just the diagnosis of this, this seems like a really minimally invasive test that you can do that gives you actual quantifiable data to show whether or not someone is a fibromyalgia patient, if this is true for all people. So how hard is this to administer? And what would you suggest as far as ACR recommendations for diagnosing this? Is this something that they could use or incorporate? 
So it's not it, it it's it's relatively easy to do, but we're working on a new device. We have to you have to train the nurse or me or somebody to do it. Actually, I find the nurses do it because I've just finished with a patient. I say, would you please go in room one and and check that patient's muscle pressure? What is it? And I then I come back in again and they say it was thirty one or whatever it was. So it's 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 often done by nurses, nurse practitioners, but by doctors. And I think it would be extremely easy to do this. Very little, never seen anybody have any sort of side effects to doing just a muscle pressure assessment with a 22 gauge needle. Um, just, you know, insert it a little bit into the muscle. So I've never seen any problem with it. Um, patients are delighted to have something quantifiable. So I've been on several criteria committees to define fibromyalgia. The latest one working with Fred Wolf and uh, you know Dan Claw and Don Goldenberg and a bunch of people, um, uh, we, uh, we, Brian Wallet and others, <laughs> um, um, we um, identified the clinical criteria for fibromyalgia and even have a one sheet, a one page thing which says of the 19 pain areas, how many pain areas do you check off? Of the sleep, energy, and fiber, you know, cognitive things, zero to three, what do you check off? And, and then abdominal pain, depression, um, uh, headaches are one, one point. So if you have a 12 or more points, you probably clinically have fibromyalgia. And the American College of Rheumatology you know, validated that. They said, okay, those are the new criteria. We modified them a little bit. and. Uh, uh, Fred Wolf has worked the hardest on this, but you know we've had these committees to do it. So I've been involved in that. Will the ACR bend over to say now we're going to add muscle pressure? That might take some doing because it's political, it's bureaucratic. But if you don't have a quantifiable uh, test, it becomes you know less uh, understood, especially by primary care doctors, by by orthopedists, pain doctors. I think you need a quantifiable measure. So I think it's extremely important in getting, we're trying to get this validated, we're moving forward with it, we're having other people do it to validate it. But I think it's important, it should be part of the criteria someday. Right, right, thanks. Um, going kind of along with that, do you think in the much further future, there would be an ability to provide classes on fibromyalgia to determine the actual uh, kind of severity of the disease by patient based on the, the muscular pressure? Yes, I think there would be. So one of the things we're working on is your muscle pressure was 32 millimeters of mercury. Now we put you on muscle relaxants like flexural cyclobenzaprine. We made you sleep through the night with a little amitriptyline and stuff like that. And your pain, which was eight out of 10 is now four out of 10. It's still there. Okay, we're gonna check your muscle pressure again. And we have another paper about to come out called muscle pressure and pain. And it, the pain level correlated in those patients who had repeat muscle pressures, the pain level correlated with the muscle pressure and the pain was down on a visual analog scale, the muscle pressure was down. So I think it, it very, very much correlates. So we're sending in that paper, you know, will that be validated elsewhere? I don't know. But I think one strategy would be, let's relax the muscles. Um, you know, it's not gonna cure you, uh, what you have is a condition that's not progressive or crippling or damaging, but it certainly is affecting your life tremendously. You can be in quite a bit of pain and nobody understands you. And so we're going to use muscle pressure as a quantitative guide, including the possibility. We'd love to find a needleless device. We're working on that with several other possibilities, which we're acquiring data with needleless devices. But you, assuming we go with this, then I think it's a way of gauging response to therapy. Right, right. So also along with that, you are you kind of changed the way that we're thinking about fibromyalgia. So instead of it being a neurological disease, now it's looking at the, the actual um, pressure of the muscle itself. So given the treatment plans that most uh, physicians are using right now, are there changes that you would make to the treatment plans as far as the pharmaceuticals used um, that would be more muscular related versus neuro? Yeah, I had a patient come in the other day that I treated and he had fibromyalgia. He said for 15 years and now was gone. I said, well, well, what happened? Now he attributed it to a combination of 20 milligrams of cyclobenzaprine flexoril at night and a small dose of uh, Zoloft or, or you know, sertraline. 
I think that's hitting the central part a little bit and it's hitting the peripheral part. And, you know, he's one of these people that influenced me to try a lot of muscle relaxants, especially at night, so they're not sedating to the person. Um, and try to improve sleep often with, uh, you know, one of the tricyclics or trazodone or something. But also in some patients, if they're willing to do it, to use small doses of a serotonergic drug. So my paradigm to speak in terms of treatment would be um, a lot of muscle relaxant. I tend to use cyclobenzaprine or tizanidine. You can use up to 36 milligrams of tizanidine almost only at night, sometimes a little bit during the day. I don't use that much sertraline because it gets a little complicated in terms of why we're doing that. One could also use, you know, deloxetine and things that are um, sertraline and also increase nor, uh, epinep nor triptyline, uh, levels, uh, nor norepinephrine levels. Um, um, and um, um, so it be, might be that combination, a small dose of a serotonergic drug um, uh, or ser ser serotonergic and you know, norepinephrine or um, um, and a muscle relaxant, but I've been relying more on muscle relaxants. Okay, okay. If pressure's high, what would you use? A muscle relaxant, right? <laughs> right, right, exactly. So looking at re ongoing research now that you're looking more at the the muscle um, the muscle itself versus a neuro. Are there other areas that you feel that research should focus more heavily on in the next few years? Well, one is what you mentioned, treatment. How do we? Okay, now we have this number. Okay, what do we do with the number? Well, I think the number should go down, whether it's with natural things like yoga and meditation, but more with muscle relaxants, with good sleep, uh, restorative sleep with maybe a serotonergic drug and see if that combination of things reduces the visual analog scale muscle pain and reduces the muscle pressure. That's where I would go. Now we're also looking, as I mentioned, for needleless uh, uh, approaches. Elastography is one, uh, uh, spectroscopy is another, uh, and looking to see if there are other ways to measure this. Um, <laughs> but the main thing I would focus on a little bit is um, uh, using this as a diagnostic guide, but a guide for therapy too. Right. All right. I think that's good. Okay. So I'm going to go. Uh huh. Okay. So I've got my striker device. I've got my 22 gauge. Okay, so my 22 gauge needle, I've, it's already primed with a normal saline. So you've got your syringe, diaphragm, and your needle. And what I usually like to do is have the bevel of the needle face my direction before I puff my sticker. And so typically I'll go mid, so I'll go right here. And I'll go in about a quarter to a half inch deep. So I'll turn the device on. All right, at a 45 degree angle. One mistake in the paper is it says seven degree, 70 degree angle. It's really a 40, we changed to a 45 degree angle, but I haven't discussed it because the paper's already ready to go, but anyway. Just... Okay, all right, here goes. One, two, and three. So poke, poke, poke. Zero it out, inject my saline. Oh, you are tight, dear. Okay, 36 is what I got. Now that number went pretty fast though. It went, it started up at like 108 and then it came down pretty fast. It slowed a little bit, like by 38, 36, it paused for like a second, like really quick, and then it dropped again. So you really have to catch it when it drops, because I that's the part that's the most difficult, is when you can't catch it when it pauses, even for that short second, you can, you know, end up getting like a different reading. Deb, was that difficult or not bad? Oh, it's not bad.
Okay, so again, inserted the needle about a quarter to a half inch deep, zeroed it out, injecting saline. Watching the numbers go down and she's at 19. Okay. So it's not three times in this particular case, but only uh, close to two times, but still. Yeah. Most of our normals are actually less than 15, but you know, sometimes they're a little bit higher. Awesome, well, thank you so much for demonstrating it for us. That's amazing. Yeah, no, Welcome. Tracy, thanks for interviewing us and asking us to do it. We think it's a major development. It's a quantitative marker. It's a breakthrough in terms of understanding the etiology of the pain.